Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, this is Margaret speaking. Uh, so I'm so glad you could join us. We are together again for a third and final history session of the Symposium on Disability Cultural Centers in Higher Education. Okay, so today we're gonna to be hearing the stories of the founding of the Disability Cultural Center at Miami University um, in Ohio and at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, we're super thrilled to have um, Stan Darko and Stephanie Dawson with us today to share about Miami. So without further ado, I am going to hand the mic over to them with air quotes. Thank you, Margaret. It is an absolute pleasure to be with each of you. My name is Stephanie Dawson and I use she, her pronouns. I am the director of the Miller Center for Student Disability Services at Miami University. And we are located in Southwest Ohio in a town called Oxford, Ohio, which Dan will talk a little bit more about. I am an African-American woman and I'm wearing a um, till uh, sort of multicolored head wrap today with a light colored dress. I am working remotely from home. So I am sitting here in my um, lovely kitchen um, and I do identify as a disabled woman and it is lovely to meet you and I'll pass it over to Dan. Thanks, Stephanie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Darko. I use he, him pronouns, and I work at Miami University as the assistant director of the Miller Center for Student Disability Services. Um, my visual description is that I am a white male with light brown hair, currently wearing a uh, teal striped polo, uh, sitting in uh, my power chair. Behind me is my kitchen with some neon lights radiating from my uh, saltwater fish tank. And with that, I will share our Miami University land acknowledgement. Miami University is located within the traditional homelands of the Miamia, spelled M-Y-A-A-M-I-A, -A -A, and Shawnee, spelled S-H-A-W-N-E-E, -E, people, who along with other indigenous groups seeded these lands to the United States in the first Treaty of Greenville in, in 1795. The Miami people, who the name our university carries, were forcibly removed from these homelands in 1846. In 1972, a relationship between Miami University and the Miami tribe of Oklahoma began and evolved into a reciprocal partnership, including the creation of the Miami Center at Miami University in 2001. The work of the Miami Center serves the Miami tribe community and is dedicated to the revitalization of the Miami language and culture and to restoring that knowledge to the Miami people. Miami University and the Miami tribe are proud of this work and of the more than 140 Miami students who have attended Miami since 1991 through the Miami Heritage Award Program. And with that, I'll pass it back to Stephanie. Thank you. So we'll start a little bit. Um, I think it's important to talk about the general history of the office, um, just to understand the evolution um, for Miami University and how we really came to a critical point of having um, just the uh, buy-in and interested parties to launch us to the point of being able to have a formal disability cultural center. Um, so we are going to take it back to the 80s um, in order to um, talk about our story of how our DCC came to be. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, we had the Rehab Act of 1973, and like most institutions, as we were in the 70s and 80s, there was just gradual um, interest and request from student body um, for accommodations, but obviously still not necessarily um, the infrastructure or the knowledge within the institution. Um, 
to really do things on a broad scale. So what you really kind of saw in the 70s and 80s at Miami is very consistent with what you saw at many institutions in the U.S. during that time, um, which is really where you just had these sprinkles of champions um, who were identified um, to, you know, um, coordinate accommodations, uh, provide support for students, faculty, or staff um, who may have access needs. Um, and then also the other side of that is people may not have even been champions. It may have been sort of this add-on portion to their job, okay? And that's really what we saw a lot um, through the 70s and 80s at Miami, you know, which, you know, many of you on this call are, um, you know, familiar with similar histories. Um, then in the um, sort of mid to late 80s, you start to see things be formalized a little bit more and an actual formal position start to take place. Um, and then that kind of leads straight in, right, to passage of the ADA. And so our first sort of formal office, if you will, was actually um, first titled Handicap Services, and then it transitioned over to the title of Office of Disability Resources. And a very uh, traditional one-person office, I do like to talk about the physical location of that space because it is very critical when you look at where we're currently located. So the physical location of the office prior to being a disability cultural center was really on the outskirts of campus in an older building in a basement location, um, and not just in the basement, but in the corner of the basement. And this isn't dramatics or hyperbole, that's indeed where the office was located. Um, so what we really saw was sort of this physical representation of where this work, um, these issues existed within um, the fabric of the institution, right? Or the culture of the institution, if you will. And so um, that obviously, you know, continued well into the 90s and 2000s, but lots of strides made, but specifically more so um, in the area of physical access on campus. Um, and then also um, the work was really in um, partnership building, right? So having um, offices outside of Office of Disability Resources really have enough buy-in to where they would work and communicate and help with accommodation planning and things of that nature. So then we kind of fast forward um, into the 2000 sort of 10s kind of range, if you will. Um, so obviously you start getting into, right, we're getting into um, Section 508, we're getting uh, kind of into that amendments territory, we're getting into more emphasis on digital accessibility, okay, and I'm just sort of like flying through this timeline, but you guys know the general timeline I'm talking about. And that's where the conversation really started to shift a little bit. And you start to see this interest in um, kind of really us and our institution having this uh, mindset of thinking beyond compliance, right? Um, and that is really the time period, kind of that 2010-ish is when you start to see like sprinklings of this shift in mindset. Obviously, there also were a lot of other, you know, shifts taking place as well, um, just in the landscape in, in general. And so in 2014, um, what happened is actually in that time frame, as we start to move kind of 2010 on forward, a partnership really developed. We have a disability studies department um, at Miami University, and we actually have a minor. And so the um, faculty and, and in that department actually really started becoming really close colleagues with those of us in what is now the Miller Center. Um, and there was a really close partnership where students um, um, in our Intro to Disability Studies course, which is actually a survey course available to students in the general liberal arts curriculum. So you get a lot of students taking that course and really learning about disability history, allyship, engaging in an action project to really, you know, um, start to experiment with what it actually means to be an ally or be an advocate or be a self-advocate. And so one of the things that came out of that 
was actually an action project. And so you kind of have this history, right? That's pretty typical for most universities. But then around this 2010 mark, the energy and the mindset kind of starts to shift. You get this really close partnership with the disability studies department. You start to get a lot of student energy around this idea of creating a culture of access, moving beyond compliance. And then that was really the perfect storm for the spark of the idea for a formal disability cultural center to be realized. So Dan's going to talk a little bit about this critical period of 2014, where we have this um, really like critical action project that was an impetus, and then how that really helped us to ramp up and build capacity to become a cultural center with um, some donor funds as well. Dan, I'll pass to you. Thank you, Stephanie. So as Stephanie shared, um, 2014 was a really big year in terms of how we transitioned to support not only students, but our collaboration with the Disability Studies Program. What also occurred during that year was the creation of a student organization called the Students with Disabilities Advisory Council. And this was the first student group on campus that really centered the disabled student experience. Um, and what we found now looking back on this group, um, the community and the culture that was created amongst the executive board, also the general body, bringing in folks from across campus um, that identified as disabled. Uh, a lot of those students that were part of that organization started to take the disability studies classes together. Um, and that was a really powerful uh, moment because as Stephanie shared, one of the components of the disability studies uh, introductory course is an action project. And as students move through that curriculum, and as we saw the students that were involved in the student organization move through their program, they started that in 2014 as first year, second year students. Um, but as they move forward, um, there is a higher level course called Allies and Activists course in Disability Studies. Um, and that course uh, is actually where the group of students that had met, become you know, friends, joined in community together, were actively involved in the Students with Disabilities Advisory Council uh, regarding advocacy and awareness related to disability, identity, and culture, and really shaping uh, the narrative of disability on campus. They were all moving through this curriculum together and were taking the allies and activist course uh, within the disability studies program and part of their final project was to propose a disability cultural center on Miami University's campus. Um, so with that we were first approached um, as staff members in the student disability services office uh, by the group of students in collaboration with their faculty members about what would it look like to really formalize this desire and want for a cultural center to be had on campus. Um, so we had you know, numerous uh, meetings. There were multiple people giving their opinions and thoughts on what this can and should look like. Um, and, and really it was um, a, a perfect storm. So we had multiple meetings, Stephanie and I were part of, our previous director was also involved at the time, and the students actually presented their vision for the Cultural Center at Miami University to our Vice President for Student Life, um, came in and had a presentation with our team, with the students, clearly articulating what were the goals and objectives um, of the Cultural Center, why would this bring value to the university community, how could this advance the work of uh, access and inclusion for disabled students on campus um, and really looking for a sense of community. Um, and all of those points were uh, very much in line with where the direction of the university was headed. Um, conveniently at that time, uh, we're now fast forwarding to about the 2017 era. Um, this is where um, we were uh, approached by um, the University Advancement um, the Department, who is in charge of you know, working with prospective donors. Um, and we were uh, engaged with a, uh, a group of donors that are interested in providing funds to a uh, department or organization that does 
really great work on Miami's campus, um, but also as a connection to disability. So uh, we have, you know, been gracious to receive the support from uh, Jay Scott and Susan McDonald Miller um, as they have uh, created an endowment of uh, $1 million for the Disability Services Office. Um, and their sole uh, goal of that endowment is to support disabled students above and beyond uh, the requirements and legal obligations of disability services. So having that gift um, from the Miller family really enabled not only the students, but also our team to really invest in a cultural center and what that can look like on campus. So we not only had the student advocacy front, but we also had a funding source. And in 2017, um, the, the third piece is also space. What does space look like? How is that going to be um, created? Or is there a space that a cultural center could take place in? Um, and our office uh, was relocated at that time. Um, from what Stephanie shared earlier, where we were in a corner of a basement on the edge of campus, uh, the Disability Services Office, um, alongside other accessibility partners um, and learning support partners, we were located to a central building on campus with a great uh, space. So we were able to uh, really centralize the disabled student support uh, on campus and ha now had a location for the cultural center to take place. So we had uh, university and donor funds, we had a space, we had students that were actively engaged, um, and we had a team that was committed to doing work above and beyond uh, compliance as well. I think all of those components uh, brought together why we're able to have a disability cultural center um, on our campus and are able to continue to do work that is above and beyond what we were, are legally required to do as a disability services office, but we really are uh, energized by the opportunity to engage students in a holistic manner, including personal um, identity development and uh, collective uh, disability coalition building. So with that, Stephanie has brought up our slides here um, and I will pass it back to her to talk through what does it look like um, for us to engage as a cultural center and how does that align with the work that we do? Yeah, and I just want to take these last few minutes just to kind of highlight a few things that, you know, if I were on the call, I would want myself to share. I think some things that were critical, um, it does have to do with how we're situated in the institution. So we are within what's the division of student life, but it's the it's our student affairs uh, division. Prior to that, we were actually kind of more so um, under an, kind of an administrative umbrella, but it had a lot of academic ties. It's kind of under the umbrella with our Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity. Um, but that shift over to student life or student affairs, that was was critical in us being able, especially to secure donor funds, um, because there was just a, there was just a lot of energy um, in the division, one, around student-led initiatives, obviously being student fairs, but two, um, that division gave us access um, to a dedicated right administrator that could really help us cultivate these advancement relationships and these relationships with donors and really learn how to manage donor relations. So I just want to highlight how critical that is. Um, and then some other things, you know, that we've had to do is really um, take a look at our mission statement. Um, and so we're constantly trying to rework it. Uh, you know, so we just did a refresh that says the J. Scott and Susan McDonald Miller Center for Student Disability Services is passionate about fostering an inclusive and equitable experience for Miami students with disabilities. We partner with disabled students and campus departments to develop individualized access plans, provide training opportunities, and implement strategic initiatives to promote disability as a form of diversity. So this is one example, right? We just recently took our mission statement and now we're using both person first and identity first language, right? So we're constantly just trying to move the needle. Um, 
on on these different pieces and then the physical space is especially important students um they gather in our space it's an area for community they have access to literature around disability history and critical topics and anyone in our center knows that they can come in and access these resources and we regularly talk with classes um, and then we have a rotating art display with one of our community partners um, the only other point i really do want to make is one thing you have to think about if you're a, a traditional disability services offices as we kind of have moved into the disability cultural center space we have to be really careful about making sure that we have enough resources and human resources to manage the capacity of what we're trying to do you know for traditional right accommodation support but being able to really give energy to the cultural center piece um, and so we're always looking for opportunities to grow our staff uh, more recently we have been able to do that uh, through a lot of strategy uh, with our divisional leadership but that's something that you do have to think about right is as we take this on how are we going to make the case to make sure that we have enough human resources to do all of these things as well as possible um, and so growing our team has been critical the staff that you see uh, you're going to see uh, seven staff pictured here there are four access um coordinators one assistant director a director and a program associate um, there are two access coordinators pictured on the slide and those are newer newer staff members to our office and then we will be adding one additional position right so again you'll be looking at a total of five coordinators two leadership positions and then an administrative assistant role we do a lot of programming as well. Uh, that's a big part of our cultural center. Um, so here you see pictured, um, it's a photo. We had the traveling exhibition, Patient No More. We, we were fortunate to get that exhibit, um, which many uh, people on this call, I'm sure, are very familiar with. Um, and this is just a picture that kind of shows that dedication to programming. But again, emphasizing you do have to really have um, the resources, right, to stand these things, you know, to get these programs going. Um, so that's something that we're always trying to focus on. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop the share here. Um, that last slide that you saw that um, was um, just talking about SDAC, which Dan already talked about that student organization. So um, we're not going to discuss that further for the sake of time. I think we hit the high point, Dan. That was great. Okay. Yeah, we could talk for days. So we're going to pass it over now. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> Uh, this is Margaret speaking. Thank you both for sharing out that really helpful timeline. And um, well, I won't reflect on everything, everything everybody's saying. Hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. But I really appreciate the thoughts about like the, um, oh dear, the kind of relationship between disability studies and the development of your center. That was super interesting. Um, so thank you again. And so we also have folks, oh, did you wanna add something? Oh, you're just saying goodbye, okay. Um, we also are so fortunate to have um, Karen Nielsen and Anne Yi Kwong from UC Berkeley with us today. So I am gonna turn it over to them in just a moment so that they can share a little bit about how the campaign to have a disability, um, I believe it's called the disability community space, but please correct me if I'm wrong about that, um, on their campus. So Anne and Karen, would you like to introduce yourself and share your story? Sure. I, I, Anne asked me to go first uh, because I was more involved in the, um, the development of the center before Anne came on board as the first center full-time employee. So um, there's a couple of things I wanted to say in the beginning. First is um, that I, in some ways I feel like this is not my story to share. Um, although I was deeply involved in um, every step of the process, um, the people who really brought this to fruition were um, at two students who are no longer students at Cal um, and have both gone on to, um, to other endeavors. Um, one, one of the students' names is um, 
Elena Morales, and the other student's name is, is Katie Savin, and one was an undergraduate student, and the other was a grad student. Um, so I just want to express my gratitude first to, to Katie and Alana for their leadership efforts in bringing our center about. Um, we are the, I think, the baby center of the group. We're, we're the youngest uh, and, and newest center of this groups that we've heard from today. And it's been so fascinating to hear uh, the histories of how those centers came about, each one so differently, and also people's different ideas about the um, alignment of a cultural center and what is the best alignment for a cultural center. And I will say from my perspective, similarly to the alignment of a disability resource center, or disability services office, I think that the alignment of a disability cultural center is, is going to be very unique depending on the needs of, and the history of the campus. Um, and that every campus is going to be different in, in that regards. But what's most important is to um, respect the, um, the the desires of the the community. Um, and speaking of which, I think I jumped like three steps ahead. I forgot to introduce myself and and to tell you about me. And I'm so sorry. Um, so let me let me back up. I'm, I'm Karen Nielsen. I am the, um, the director of the Disabled Students Program at Cal um, for, for another a couple of weeks, and then I will be transitioning to become the director of the Disability Resource Center at UC Santa Cruz, where I hope to help that, that campus also adopt a, a disability cultural center. Um, I am a, um, a white woman. Um, I have dark hair. Um, I'm wearing a, a, a dark, uh, a black shirt. Uh, you might, uh, there's a, a cat behind me. Um, and you, there may be, may, may make a, an appearance during, during my talk. Um, and I am uh, in my uh, living room this afternoon. Um, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So I apologize for skipping over the most important way that I needed to start. Um, so going back into the, the history, um, many of you are probably familiar with some of the disability rights history of uh, the University of California at Berkeley. Um, many well-known activists have sprung up from uh, UC Berkeley and <coughs> Excuse me, and um, and 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 many are still connected with with UC Berkeley, and so um, the the history of of the uh, disability rights movement connected to UC Berkeley is very well known in in, in many parts. Um, and for those of you who are interested in that history, um, the Bancroft Library actually has archives and oral histories um, connected to Ed Roberts and others, uh, Judy Human, who um, were our, our alumni from the UC Berkeley and who were deeply involved in the um, disability rights movement, including Section 504 and the ADA. And we're really proud of that history, but I would say that it's, um, it's both a blessing and sometimes, um, it, sometimes the university does not live up to that history. Um, so one of the things that I've been trying to bring about it during my six year tenure at um, UC Berkeley is to bring the reality of today more in line with the, the splendid history of, um, of the um, both UC Berkeley, Cal and also Berkeley. Um, and also to, change a culture where quite honestly um, the everything that has happened on our campus in regards to disability rights has been as a result of people with disabilities um, fighting for it. Um, I did not identify myself in terms of uh, my disability status. I am a person with mental health disabilities. Uh, I do openly identify that way. And I have an, uh, an, an emotional support animal who comes to work with me each day. So I do identify as a member of the community. 
and um, learned soon after my uh, beginning of my tenure on campus that really the, there it is not a fact that the, that the administration at um, at Cal is more favorable toward or more inclined to support the efforts of um, disability access, although I hope that that's changing. Um, but it, it is a fact that it, everything that has happened here is because of activism and because of the work of faculty, staff, and students who, who care about um, both access and disability community in the broadest senses. So with all of that said, I'll get to the, the more specific history of the, um, the development of our cultural center. So there had been efforts um, from back in the 70s when um, uh, the, um, the, the activism of for to include uh, physically disabled students began on our campus in the 1960s and 70s. There had been efforts as far back as that to create a, a disability cultural center, but um, those efforts had never come to fruition. Um, like many of your campuses, space is very high premium at Cal and probably more than most. Uh, the reason being that we're in the middle of a very urban environment and there's very little place for us to grow while the campus continues to grow programming and continues to grow class sizes and continues to grow the student body, the space that we have does not grow. So um, space is very difficult um, and is very political on our campus. And so although efforts and demands had been made over the course of 30 years for a cultural center to be established, it was there was never a, a formally a cultural center established. Um, and then um, when I started at Cal, there was again an, a student effort, a demand letter that was given to the chancellor um, requesting a, a, a disability cultural center. Like others had described on, uh, on our campus, um, there, were, there were a number of other cultural centers that had been established um, and that had space and that had um, resources, um, including uh, uh, gender equity, um, including the Fannie Lou Hamer Center, which is an African-American cultural space. Um, the, we, there's, um, there were also um, efforts toward building a Native American cultural center and a Latinx cultural center, which have also come to fruition recently. Um, but there, you, there were already some non-compliance resources available to support students in those cultural groups. So um, when I started at Cal, I recognized that um, one of the things that our community needed in order to feel truly heard and seen by the campus and administration was a community center. And by the way, we call, we call the center the, the Disability Cultural Community Center, DCC for short. Um, and um, I immediately, as a, as a part of the efforts um, that I was, I was in a lot of rooms in the beginning of my tenure because there were a lot of complaints. There was a, there was a lot of change that needed to happen um, on our campus around um, mo mainly compliance, but also culture. And um, um, so I was in a lot of rooms with a lot of people working on access for employees, access for students, uh, creating a, 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 a office of, um, with a, um, sorry, Section 504 and ADA coordinator who, who a compliance officer who had the authority and the resources to um, make changes on our campus, which did not exist at the time that I started. And so one of the things that I brought to all of those tables was the need for a, a, a cultural center and honestly um, got no traction at all in, in, in those conversations. Um, so 
we've always had groups of student activists. They've they've changed their names over the the course of time, um, um, to depending on you know what what was happening at the time. Um, the current, I believe, the current um, iteration is they call themselves the ASU Disabled Students Committee. Um, but it's basically they are they've always been groups of students advocating for the needs of the disabled student community. And um, there were students that the effort, the current efforts that led to our current center started in 2017. And there were there were a couple of students, I mentioned their names earlier, Elena Morales and um, Katie Sabin, who was a grad student, who were very interested in um, bringing students together to um, have in, an organized effort to create a disability cultural community center. And in addition, there were um, disability studies faculty and disabled staff who were also interested in supporting their efforts. Um, so those students took the lead and um, but what happened first is that I sat down with them and said, um, you know, staff and people who work for the campus are not going to get any traction on trying to um, bring this about. Um, so what can what can I do um, as the director of DSP and how can I um, activate other staff and faculty to assist you in bringing this effort about? And so the students um, through, over the course of several years, first first step was um, a meeting with the ch chancellor and um, requesting her support for the development of the cultural center. Um, I, I will say that our current chancellor has demonstrated more interest and more concern about the disability community than, than any prior chancellor has. And, and we're very appreciative of her for that. Um, so we met with her, um, the students presented their concerns and their request, and the chancellor um, agreed that a cultural center in, in principle would, would, was needed for the campus and that it should happen. And um, she gave her blessing and then nothing happened. <laughs> so, um, the students then were faced with, well, Chancellor has given her blessing. What is next? What are we? What are we? What are we supposed to do? So they were given, you know, several different um, um, paths that they should take um, in terms of proposals, and um, none of them were straightforward or 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 easy to identify who who the players were or who who they should be talking to so it, it really took um the support of equity and inclusion the vice chancellor of equity and inclusion and um several written proposals with support from 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 um equity and inclusion from myself from the faculty um, uh, from um, other staff. And eventually the students were able to go in front of the, um, sorry, I need to watch the time. Um, the, the students were able to go in front of the Space Assignments and Capital Improvements Committee, which is called SACI. Um, and the um, SACI committee had agreed to hear hear about the proposal and discuss the proposal. And um, on the day that that happened, our students also organized right outside the space where the um, where the meeting happened, um, a um, protest. And it was um, it was a very dark and dismal and rainy day. <laughs> Um, and so the turnout wasn't as huge as we would have hoped, but it was heartening because the people that showed up at the protest included um, students, faculty, staff, administrators, 
uh, many people who were in, in, in strong support of, of the establishment of, of a cultural community center. Um, the students were not allowed to present to that committee. Um, the, the, the person who presented to the committee was um, the Vice Chancellor of Equity and Inclusion. Um, and that in and of itself was problematic that they were not allowed to present the, 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 the um, uh, proposal that they had spent several years writing and, bring, and, and bringing to fruition. Um, some of the questions that came up at the time uh, before the vote included, you know, the, the kinds of questions that we always hear, like, um, it, well, is there really a, a dis disabled community? Um, you know, do will the center be used? Is 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 there a need for this? What kinds of programming would 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 a culture community center for disabled people provide? And you know. Um, Thankfully, there were there were enough people in the room who were able to answer those questions and address it. And eventually, um, the Saki committee did vote again in principle <laughs> to provide a space, but did not identify immediately a um, an, an exact location for for the center. Um, and so then again, um, there was a, a group of um, disabled students, faculty and staff who um, toured set a number of spaces on campus to, to determine um, what spaces would actually work for our community based on access and also on the, 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 um, the uh, size of the community. At Cal, we have um, 3,700 students who identify. Um, with disabilities. So that's just people who identify. Um, and we also have faculty and staff who identify as, as people with disabilities. So we needed a larger space um, because it, it will be a busy and, and active space. Um, and so the, the, group, the group toured a number of spaces on campus um, and finally identified two spaces that were, would work. And um, again, it took about another nine months before a space was actually provided to the community. Um, but it, it did happen and um, it happened in the summer of um, 20, let's see, 2020. Um, we finally got word that, that a space had been allocated in Hurstfield Annex. Um, and it's a, it, it's, the space is, um, has room for um, large events. It has a conference room. It has office space for Anne, who is our coordinator, who will speak in a minute. Um, it has room for a, a disability studies library, um, which has some of the archives of our campus history. It has a flex room that students can use to, to meet um, their medical needs for privacy. Um, it will have lockers. It has a, um, an, an office where um, community providers can rotate through and meet with students. Um, it's a really beautiful space. The campus, um, the ENI, Equity and Inclusion, also gave um, the center um, $500,000 to renovate the space because it was not suitable for um, the needs at the time that it was turned over to us. So that, those renovations have, have just about been completed and um, we are waiting for furniture. Um, in the meantime, um, I was able to obtain um, Campus B grant to hire a full-time coordinator for the center. And um, along with a, a group of many of the people who had, had worked on um, advocating for the center, including Katie and Elena, we all met together and interviewed candidates. And we had, I will say, the most stellar group of candidates. We were, we were, we were just, it was um, an incredible group of people who um, applied for the position and we were, we were so lucky. But Anne, with her, um, her her background as a, a community advocate in in our community and also as a graduate of UC Berkeley 
um, emerged as the best person to, to lead our, our center into the future. And with that, I'll, I'll let Anne um, add to her thoughts. Oh, hey, this is Margaret speaking. And I'm so sorry, I actually muted you because you were unmuted. And so I'm gonna unmute you again if I can find you on the list. Okay, I think you might have to confirm it. Hi, am I coming through? You are currently audible. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Perfect, thank you so much. Apologies for that confusion. This is Anne. Um, I'll give a brief introduction and image description. And I think Karen did a fantastic job in sharing all of the institutional knowledge and providing historical context for the center. And I'll just uh, conclude with adding a little bit about since I've been hired, uh, what has transpired and some recent history I actually learned um, about the really need, desire and interest for organic spaces for disabled community members and students to meet one another. So to go back to my introduction, um, again, my name is Anne Wai Yi Kuang. I use she, her pronouns. Definitely thrilled and privileged to be able to share space with my co-panelists, as well as thank Margaret and Javin for the invitation um, to really have this DCC community. I'm currently the coordinator of the Disability Cultural Community Center at UC Berkeley. And I am wearing a black blazer with a polka dot dress and have a floral ribbon in my hair. And I identify as blind. And so I think one of the things that Karen really touched upon is how long overdue these efforts of creating and establishing a cultural center on the campus has been. Um, and I concur and agree wholeheartedly with Karen that Berkeley has had a reputation of being inclusive. Berkeley, the city itself in the Bay Area is where the disability rights movement originated. And sometimes the campus um, and the overall area can feel like we're already doing a lot as it is. And perhaps we don't need to continue to innovate and push as often. So I definitely am grateful for Elena, for Katie, for Karen, and all of the students, staff, and community members who really did all the hard work in writing the proposals, um, really fighting for a spot at all of these conversations and all of these rooms and creating a space and an urgency for the center. So really grateful for those efforts without which the center wouldn't necessarily exist and we wouldn't have such important spaces on campus come into fruition. So I shared earlier that I actually recently learned of efforts back in the 60s and 70s and 80s from disability activists that had wanted a cultural space. Back then, especially an article recently published in Stat News shared that in the 1980s, there was a little known spot on the Berkeley campus located in the basement, and I see a theme here, of the Moffat Library called The Cave. This was where a lot of folks and students who identify as blind, visually impaired, or low vision gathered. Originally, it was designed to be a resource center space, but it became a community space, one of the first of its kind in an in a informal maker space where folks taught each other technology. Eventually, due to various changes, that space disappeared. Then when I was a student at Berkeley in the 2010s, there was a program called the Disabled Students Residence Program, which provided informal as well as uh, programming for students with disabilities on campus to gather, meet one another. And due to various budgetary constraints, that program eventually also disappeared. 
And I think through all of these various generational changes, students by 2017 felt like this was enough. We've been wanting and craving that cultural space to connect and to organize. And maybe we have it for a little bit and then all of a sudden it's gone. So I think that they folks have shared some of that trauma they felt from give, being given a space and then the space is gone really pushed them this time um, in 2017 to organize and create a petition and work with disabled staff, faculty to create a sustainable plan to bring the Disability Cultural Center proposal space into fruition. I'm going to end um, with sharing, now that I've been hired in the 2021 April timeframe, um, we have developed in consultation with an advisory committee of stakeholders, including disabled students, faculty, and staff, a mission statement and three core values. Um, I'm sure there will be time tomorrow to go more in depth into how this came into being, but I'll briefly share our three core values. The first is from the protest slogan that the students chanted and expressed, community not compliance. Folks really crave that space to organically build relationships. Second is education through empowerment. And that really relates to archiving disability history, bringing awareness, and also exploring our own disability identity through self-exploration and intersectional lenses. And the third is collaborate and co-create with other cultural centers, um, additional historically marginalized groups on campus to continue to advocate and push for a more equitable and inclusive campus climate. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. This is Margaret speaking. Um, thank you so much, Anne and Karen, for sharing um, those pretty complex stories and histories. Um, it's I think people have been mentioning that it's just so fascinating to hear how this has all played out in different places and with different variables that really, really matter. Like the Saki committee kind of sounds like it's pretty epic. Um, so I'm just looking at the time and I, we have about two minutes. So I'm actually thinking that in the spirit of some of the other history, we've ended up kind of running out of time for Q and A. So I think I will just say thank you, thank you to Dan, to Stephanie, to Karen, and to Anne for sharing the stories of your center's development. Um, and I will invite everyone to enjoy an hour break before the next session if you're able to join us. We're really looking forward to wrapping up with some original research about the impact of disability cultural centers from some of like the you know the up and coming emergent scholars in the in the now existent field. Um, so thank you again to everyone who came and shared your history and your perspective on the creation of your disability cultural center. And have a good night. Thank you.